January 13, 1994. Tonight on Primetime. And I looked up and I saw the helicopters. And I heard the gunshots. It sounded like war had started. World War III. Turning point at Waco. The untold story. It was the longest and deadliest standoff in law enforcement history. Tonight, for the first time, you're going to hear from people who were inside the compound until the last fiery moments. The wall next to me caught on fire. And I was like, for your life, get out. Also, one of the children lived in the compound and whose mother died in the fire. She said goodbye and to be good and to take care of the necklace um, that she gave me. News exclusive. New details on the way federal agents botched the initial raid. Instead of just saying, I made a mistake or we made a mistake, the agents in charge try to hide the truth. Also, we'll tell you about the government conflict over how to deal with a man who thought he was the Messiah. But who was David Koresh and what was his magnetic appeal? He said he was God and that he carried God's seed. For the first time, we hear from the grandmother who helped raise the man who would lead so many to the apocalypse. He used to say that he would die someday for his beliefs in God. Tonight, Turning Point at Waco, the untold story. From ABC News, with anchors Diane Sawyer, Sam Donaldson, Chief Correspondent Chris Wallace, Judd Rose, Sylvia Chase, John Quinones, and Renee Poussin. This is Prime Time. Prime Time. Now from New York, Diane Sawyer. Good evening. Sam is off tonight. No matter how many times we hear the story of ordinary Americans led to their death by a self-proclaimed prophet, we're always left with the same question. Why? Why did a little boy named Vernon Howell come to think of himself as David Koresh, the Anointed One? Why did people from all over the world of different ages, different backgrounds, join him at the desolate ranch outside Waco? As you know, the trial of the surviving Branch Davidians got underway in Texas this week, but six months ago, we started trying to find some answers and to persuade some of the people who knew Koresh best to talk to you. Tonight, you're going to hear about two cultures, the one inside the compound and the one outside, the Washington bureaucracy trying to fathom what to do after the first raid on the compound led to a standoff. And whatever you think of Koresh's followers, everyone we talked to professed a genuine belief that David Koresh was a holy man and that God was about to bring on the end of the world. Now, the story of the apocalypse at Waco. Jesus said that in his kingdom, among his people, there are... In the prairie towns of Central Texas, Bible stories are told and retold. Here, on a back road outside Waco, 126 men, women, and children built a wooden fortress on a hill to wait for the final reckoning. God is going to bring cataclysmic events that are going to try to wake people up. A lot of people say, you're waiting for the end of the world? Well, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. She said, you know, it's going to be like a dream. Things are going to happen, and it's going to be like a dream. And you know, almost hard to believe. <laughs> Been like a dream. For years, the man who called himself David Koresh preached and sang about a battle that would signal the end of the world. The last thing David said to me on the day of the raid was, they're coming, they're here. at the compound. By the time it was over, four federal agents and six Branch Davidians were dead. 32 others on both sides were wounded. David Koresh's followers were convinced they were watching the last of the great biblical prophecies unfold. 
Inside, Koresh, bleeding from a gunshot wound, called his mother. Said, don't worry, Grandma. I said, it's not so bad to die. I said, uh, I'll be resurrected. Uh, I'll be merciful, OK? I'll, I'll see you all in the skies. Bye. The man now known to the world as David Koresh was born Vernon Howell in East Texas in 1959. His mother was 14 when she got pregnant. His teenage father disappeared. His mother and grandmother told us, looking back, this seems to be the key to the boy they raised. You know, I had David when I was very young, and uh, I was never married to his father. And so I think he always felt a void in his life, his own father, his, his grandfather, his stepfather. The men in his life did not accept him the way he wanted to be. Well, most of the men in Vernon's life wasn't interested in any kid as far as that went. I mean, you know, I was in the, hello, how are you, and get out of my way. <laughs> he later said his stepfather, a carpenter, beat him. He was also dyslexic and had trouble fitting in at school. But by the time he was 12, he had found something to fill that void. It seemed like he was searching for something, so that when he did find the Bible and God, I mean, that's what he latched on to. He learned huge sections of the Bible by heart. He joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church, where they worshipped a vengeful God who would end the world in a violent final reckoning. He used to say that he would die someday for his beliefs in God. And, of course, we just thought he was joking around. We didn't really take him serious. As a teenager, Vernon Howe would interrupt the sermons to correct the minister. But when he was thrown out of the church at age 21, it was not for his theology, but for sleeping with the 15-year-old daughter of a church elder. They got real angry and, and told him if he didn't leave, they'd throw him out of the church bodily. In 1981, Howell, searching for a church that would accept him, drove three hours west to Mount Carmel, a small religious commune outside of Waco. They called themselves the Branch Davidians. They'd broken away from the Adventist church in 1934 because they were convinced that the reckoning, the end of the world, was imminent. Now, human beings who have decided they wanted to know God. Catherine Madison had been a Davidian for 15 years when Vernon Howell arrived. A brash, handsome guitar player who could also recite long Bible passages from memory. Being the great men of the earth, crying to the rock of Mount, following us, hiding in the face of the one on the throne and for the wrath of the Lamb. Within a year, Vernon Howell had become the Branch Davidians' new prophet. The angel tells John in chapters four to come up where yes. he will not do it. I just said, I'm sorry. But this is the this is the person that has the truth. And so the truth is what I want. This time, no one objected when Howell, now 25, took 14-year-old Rachel Jones, one of his followers, as his wife. By 1991, he had recruited more than 100 followers, principally from Adventist groups around the world, to build a new Mount Carmel. He had begun calling himself David Koresh. His name's Koresh, according to scripture. After two Old Some Testament kings, major. Ruth Riddle had met Koresh in Canada, and drawn by his vision of spiritual purity, she came to Waco. Getting back to God, getting back to the basics, was the route to um, a clear mind and clear understanding, um, sort of like getting rid of all the trappings. Wayne Martin was a Harvard Law School graduate who had fallen away from the Adventist church. Koresh had gone to North Carolina after one of Martin's five children was paralyzed by meningitis. And Wayne's wife, Sheila, says Koresh renewed her husband's faith. David was a very special, very important person to us. He uh, was very kind, very loving, very understanding, very patient. One by one, they came to Waco. The vulnerable, the devout, the unlikely. 
Margarita Vallega was a model in Hong Kong and Hawaii, once married to a wealthy businessman. She was a beautiful woman. She was very glamorous. A pretty happy-go-lucky person, I guess, spending my dad's money, having all the maids taking care of everything. Ursula, Margarita's older daughter, says her mother changed after marrying her second husband, Neil Vallega, a baker who was also an Adventist. Neil convinced an uncertain Margarita to give up everything to God. I could see that there was a struggle. She wanted to stay with Neil, she wanted to believe, but I knew that she wasn't really sure. And, but then she was scared enough you know, the alternative was burn in hell. Ursula stayed behind when her mother and Neil left for Waco, but they took her half-sister, Joanne, then 18 months old, with them. After four yes, years with the Davidians, the glamorous Hong Kong socialite had become difficult to recognize. Does he say he's the son of God? He doesn't say that. But, but do you, you think know, he is? I hope he is. David Koresh directed his followers to tear down all the single-family homes and construct one big communal building. There were men's quarters on the ground floor, women's quarters and Koresh's bedroom on the second. There was a four-story tower, a chapel, a gym, and in the center, a large cement storage room. On the north side was a secret room, a buried school bus accessible from inside the building through a trap door. We were living um, as a group together um, with all things in common, as the early disciples did. The Davidians, who spent long days on construction, lived frugally, scavenging spoiled fruits and vegetables at local supermarkets. Women were not permitted to wear makeup, low necklines, short dresses, or short hair. There were daily Bible studies. There's a new judgment on one question. All I care about when I judge men is one thing. Do you want to know the seven seals? Koresh was obsessed with the seven seals, a mysterious reference in the final passages of the New Testament. He believed the seals held the key to God's plan for the end of the world. And the Davidians we spoke to told us Koresh was convinced God had chosen him to reveal the secrets of the seals. Well, when Christ comes again, what's he going to bring? Uh -huh. And he's going to reveal what? Seven, seven seals. seals. Koresh's sermons, up to 12 hours long, would often end with a jam session from his rock band. The songs, written by him, all had the same theme, a final battle with the non-believers. In fact, Koresh had begun secretly purchasing weapons, and he instructed the women to sew black military-style uniforms. And government sources insist that some of his men began a sort of military training, rigorous exercise, target practice, and that Koresh called them his mighty men. We've also learned that it was at this time Koresh started to talk openly about something he'd been doing secretly for years. David said that every woman in the world, no matter who she was, belonged to him, to belong to God. He said he was God, and that he carried God's seed, and you could have God's child. Robin Buns, who grew up with the Davidians, at 17 became one of a group of teenage girls Koresh called his biblical wives. I mean, I was willing to do that, to give up everything, to be that close to God. Koresh eventually declared that even the married women were his, insisting that God had ordered their husbands to be celibate. He selected as many as 20 girls and women to be his so-called wives, some as young as 12 years old. Together, they bore him 15 children. Koresh called them God's grandchildren. Sort of like little half-gods running around, you know. <laughs> Sounds crazy, but that's what he believed. And Robin Buns left in 1990. She says Koresh abused her and their 18-month-old son. He used to spank Sean severely to where it draw, drew blood on his behind and Sean was scared to death of Vernon, scared to death of him. It was charges of child abuse that first drew official attention to Mount Carmel. After former Davidians who had returned to their homes in Australia complained to the American embassy there, an Australian news crew traveled to Waco to investigate. Yes, I spanked children. 
Uh, I spank my children when they do wrong. Forty minute spankings? No. Repeated spankings? Oh, no, no, no. We had no evidence, so it was a very frustrating time for us. Beginning um, in February of 1992, Joyce Sparks of the Texas Child Protective Services made a series of trips to the compound and spent hours talking with Koresh, who attempted to recruit her, too. He would talk about the military takeover, that they were going to come and try to get him, and that there was going to be fire, and that the saints were going to die. The he conversations alarmed her. As for child abuse, everyone at the compound denied it. And over Sparks' objections, her department closed the case. An accident in May of 1992 set the stage for the showdown with the government. A package on its way to the compound by UPS ripped open. Inside, hand grenades. Over the next few months, the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms traced shipments of thousands of rounds of ammunition, a grenade launcher, and explosive chemical powders. There were AK-47 and M-16 rifles and the parts to turn them into fully automatic weapons. By late November, the ATF believed it had probable cause to arrest David Koresh or federal firearms violations. The thought was that at some point he was going to have a conflict with someone, whether it was law enforcement or some private citizen or some follower, and at that point he might use those weapons um, against whoever he's having a conflict with. Later, Ron Noble, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, would lead the federal investigation into the disastrous attempt to arrest Koresh. In January 1993, an ATF undercover team set up surveillance in a rented house across the road. One of them, Agent Robert Rodriguez, began going to Koresh's Bible studies. They, they asked me directly, what will happen if we execute a search warrant? The ATF consulted Joyce Sparks as well. And I said, his followers believe that he is the Lamb of God. If you try to execute a warrant with force, they're going to get their guns and they're going to shoot you. But the ATF went ahead with plans for a surprise raid of the compound, set for a time when the men were outside and the weapons locked up. They would later be criticized for not arresting Koresh off the compound on one of his frequent trips into town. On the morning of February 28th, an hour before the scheduled raid, Agent Robert Rodriguez enters the compound one last time. He started talking about the Bible with Koresh as he always had. Um, and then something unusual happened. Um, the session, the Bible session, was interrupted. We now know a Davidian follower had been tipped off to the raid. He'd run into a TV reporter who was looking for directions to the compound. When Koresh returned, he was agitated. He was nervous. He couldn't concentrate on the Bible lesson. And he says, they're coming, Robert. They're coming. ATF and the National Guard are coming. It's now clear Koresh knew Robert Rodriguez was a federal agent. And Robert didn't know what was going to happen. Koresh shook his hand and said, good luck, Robert. Agent Rodriguez went back to the undercover house to warn the agents in charge that the surprise was blown. The number two guy you know, gets in his truck, speeds, rushes to the staging area where all the um, ATF agents are gathering and says, come on, they know we're coming. Koresh knows we're coming. Robert's come out. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Hurry. The decision to go ahead. The Treasury report says that was the crucial mistake. I guess the sound of helicopters drew me to the window. My mom came in the room, grabbed me off, the, off of my bed, and she said, whatever you do, be quiet. And then... My dad and some other guys came up with the, um, the uniforms that my mom had sewed on and was all dressed up, had guns. To this day, there is no proof who shot first. The ATF claims the Davidians opened fire. Surviving Davidians like David Thibodeau say Koresh wanted to negotiate. He's saying, hold on. Wait a second, with this hand, he's holding it out like this. There's women and children here. We, you know, we want to talk about this. And then I heard the gunshots, just everywhere. People were going, crawling on the, on the knees out in the hallway, and they said, just stay down, stay down. 
911, what's your emergency? There are 75 men around our building and they're shooting at us in Mount Carmel. Wayne Martin, the Harvard Law School graduate, phones the Waco police. Tell them there are children and women in here and to call it off. The mothers and the people gathered the kid, the children up and they had them on the floor in the hallway and, and was over them trying to protect them. There was babies crying, so they were trying to to let the babies be quiet, but they wouldn't. An hour into the shootout, negotiators finally make phone contact with David Koresh. Hello? Yes. This is Dave Koresh. At first, Koresh gives them a Bible lesson. Okay. It's your Bible. There's seven seals. Let me, can I interrupt you for a minute? Sure. All right. We can talk theology, but right no, now. This is life. This is life and death. The theology that's, that's what I'm talking about. is life and death. Finally, at 11.39 a.m., two hours after the shooting began, Koresh gives permission for the ATF to enter the compound and evacuate its casualties. Four agents and six Davidians are dead. Thirty-two others, among them Koresh himself, are wounded. The longest and deadliest standoff in law enforcement history has begun. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The guy's tough. He's got more than guns. He's got God. When we come back, as the siege held the nation and the world spellbound, exclusive documents obtained by ABC News detail the battle of wills as the FBI tries to get Koresh followers to renounce him and break away. ATF's tragic blunder on February 28th has become the FBI's nightmare. So there'll be no excuses! A man believing he is the Messiah and 118 of his followers barricaded with weapons inside a well-supplied compound. Worse yet, 46 children, most of them younger than 10 years old, also inside. Tragedy tonight in Waco, Texas. The bloodiest day in the history of the federal ATF agency. Everything that could go wrong. For the next 51 ages. days, the world watches, but from a distance. The press is kept behind a roadblock over two miles away. What really happened beyond the camera's range is only now beginning to emerge. ABC News has pieced together the details of a drama pitting not only the Branch Davidians against the FBI, but the FBI itself in conflict over how to bring Koresh and the Davidians out alive. On a guard, present off. The battle lines are already drawn as shaken ATF agents mourn their dead, killed in the bloodiest operation in ATF history. We are deeply saddened. Our hearts go out to those, to these brave agents <clears throat> who died today in the line of duty and to their families. We're working towards what you want. That first night, the FBI's chief negotiator, Byron Sage, is on the phone with Davidian Wayne Martin. No matter what happens, we always follow God's destiny. Oh, okay. I, I, can, I can relate to that. And we wanted to identify as many people as we could. Were they there voluntarily? Could they, in fact, leave any time they wanted, as, as David uh, Koresh repeatedly said they could? And nobody wanted to leave. The followers we spoke to say they stayed not because they were threatened, but because they believed in Koresh. And for the first time, they've told us what was going on inside. Well, we didn't have the lights on, you know. We were afraid that any time they'd start shooting. We didn't know what they were doing. Koresh is wounded in the side and his left wrist, though clearly not critically. He lies surrounded by a group of followers in a second-floor hall. Someone has brought out a radio and a portable television. Koresh talks to the press on his cell phone. There's, there's a lot of children here. I've had a lot of babies these past few years. And it's true, I do have a lot of wives. They're walking towards the gate. They're walking toward the gate, and they're walking with a flashlight, so it should let people on the perimeter know. Over the first two days, Koresh allows 14 children to leave. Only the children who are not his. I was downstairs getting ready to leave. She was carrying me up to the door. 
Just after midnight on the second day, Margarita Vallega says goodbye to her daughter, Joanne. She asked David if she could go, and he said, he said no, because he, he only was going to let the children out. And she said goodbye and to be good, and to take care of the um, necklace that she gave me. What was the necklace? It was her necklace that she was wearing. Why do the heathen rage? At first, the FBI pursues a strategy of conciliation. For hours, listening to Koresh talk about the Bible, attempting to give him whatever he wants. On the third day, even broadcasting a taped sermon. My name is Dave Koresh. I'm speaking to you from Mount Carmel Center. In return, Koresh is to release everyone, adults and the remaining children. After the time of the tape, uh, we were getting all the children out. We had them downstairs. They had their pockets stuffed with candy and things, and they had all their toys, and they had their t clothes, and everyone was feeling really good. We were excited about it. FBI buses arrived to take the Davidians away. And at some point, we realized it's been a long time. No one's coming down. What's happening? And we went back upstairs, and David was praying, praying very earnestly that God would please turn the situation around. Chorus refused to honor his promise and has indicated he will keep his promise to come out when he receives further instruction from God. Do you people believe that Koresh is actually talking to God? <laughs> Koresh believes he's talking to God. It is now day four of the siege. Over the next week, negotiators continue their appeals to Koresh, but add something new, trying to increase the pressure on him. An elite paramilitary hostage rescue team is brought in, and army tanks. To the Davidians, it seems Koresh's prophecies of an apocalyptic showdown are coming true. We were experiencing the, the, the time of the judgment when God saw everything we were doing, and we were living a tale that was told. Koresh has taken to his bedroom, nursed by his wives. There are no more Bible studies. Each Davidian gets only two ladles of water a day. God is punishing them, Koresh says, for the times they disobeyed. He said God was bringing about this situation to help us to see that David was there for, for all of us and that he was teaching us the prophecies, was t teaching us the right things. David felt that the prophecies of the book of Revelation were being fulfilled this very week, this very day in Waco, Texas. Philip Arnold is a theologian with a specialty in apocalyptic groups. He spends hours on the phone advising the FBI. The book of Revelation predicts that God's people would be killed in two phases. Phase A, the first phase, would be a killing spree. Arnold tells the FBI Koresh believes the shootout with the ATF in which six Davidians have died is that first killing spree, and that the second is soon to come. So David believed he was in a waiting period, that God commanded him and his people to remain, to wait inside Mount Carmel until the rest of them were killed. On the eighth day of the standoff, Koresh says the 25 children who remain inside, his children, will not come out. From the moment the kids stopped coming out, I felt that, that we weren't going to get any more children and that those children were going to die. The impression is reinforced when the FBI learns that Margarita Vallega has sent a note out with her daughter, Joanne. The note that my mother had included was in the jewelry box that carried her necklace that she gave to Joanne. And uh, I open it and it said, that by the time you read this note, I'll probably be dead. Take good care of Joanne. She's yours. Love you much, Mom. As the siege wore on, this was the central question for the FBI. If they increased the pressure on the compound, would it succeed in driving a wedge between Koresh and his followers? Or would his followers stay bound to him to the end? Publicly, the FBI spoke with one voice as gradually, over the days and weeks, they tightened the screws in Waco. But it's now clear that privately the agency was deeply divided, as some people urgently advise a very different course.
A series of internal FBI memos obtained exclusively by ABC News shows that at this time, two of the FBI's own behavioral scientists warned that closing in on Koresh with all those tanks, helicopters, and uniformed men could have disastrous consequences. Every time his followers sense movement of tactical personnel, they write, Koresh validates his prophetic warnings that an attack is forthcoming. They caution that the possibility of a mass suicide cannot be discounted and that attacking the compound could result in a tremendous loss of life. To ensure the safety of the remaining children, they twice suggest the FBI do the opposite of what Koresh is expecting and consider moving back its perimeter of men and military hardware. And ABC News has also learned that these recommendations were greeted with disfavor by FBI commanders on the ground. And afterwards, in frustration, Special Agent Pete Smerick, the chief author of the memos, took himself off the case and never returned to Waco. Instead, the FBI decided to cut off electricity at the compound and move its men and hardware a little closer every day to show the Davidians that the FBI, not Koresh, is in charge. He has indicated to us that he has sufficient firepower to blow up the Bradley vehicles, and in fact, his words were, we are ready for war. Let's get it on. In response to the threats, the FBI brings in Abrams tanks, the heaviest tanks in the Army's arsenal. And as nearly everyone remembers, bombards the compound with annoying sounds. who had been releasing a few people at a time, now sends out a message. Because of the loud music, he says, nobody is coming out. But the FBI was committed to its course. By the third week of the standoff, negotiators are ordered to cease talking with Koresh about the Bible at all. What we did not want to do is get into a uh, debate with this individual regarding biblical fact, fiction, or fantasy. Fourteen adult Davidians have been released and taken into custody, including Sheila Martin and Catherine Madison. The FBI is now considering a new plan, an assault on the compound using tear gas and tanks. After 23 frustrating days of negotiations, the FBI has all but given up on trying to talk the Davidians out. Through negotiators, Ursula sends a note to her mother. And I just told her that we'll make it through it and just come home. Just come home. As I just kept, I like wrote that a couple times, I remember, just, just come home. Turning Point at Waco. The Untold Story, when prime time continues after this from our ABC stations. In a moment, we'll take you inside the compound during those frantic final moments. The fire got so hot, um, was coming down the hallways, outside the windows. For the Branch Davidians, the apocalypse David Koresh had promised was finally at hand. When prime time continues. It is the end of March. The standoff in Waco is one month old and has cost over four million dollars so far. It is becoming an embarrassing daily soap opera starring the FBI and its public enemy number one. Vernon Howell thinks he's the Lamb of God, when all he is is a cheap thug who interprets the Bible through the barrel of a gun. There is one last possibility for negotiation. Uh, David? I'm here. Uh, this is Dick DeGarren. The FBI allows Dick DeGarren, an attorney retained by Koresh's mother, to go in and out of the compound for a week meeting with Koresh. On the 46th day of the siege, April 14th, Koresh writes to Guerin that God has told him to write down his interpretation of the seven seals, and Koresh promises that when it's finished, he and his people will come out. The people we were dealing with here were extremely committed to uh, Mr. Koresh. They were 
uh, committed beyond return. You need to realize... In spite of the letter, lead negotiator Byron Sage tells FBI officials in Washington he's convinced the Davidians are not planning to come out. On April 17th, Attorney General Janet Reno approves an FBI plan to assault the compound with tear gas and tanks. The Attorney General, Janet Reno, has yet to give a detailed explanation of her decision to order the final assault on Waco. Was it because of fear of ongoing child abuse? She said that at first, but later backed off. Was it the fatigue of the hostage rescue team? Or is it simply that the FBI failed to brief her fully on the dangers of sending in tear gas and tanks? The Attorney General refused our request for an interview, saying she will speak after the trial is over. The occupants in the compound were advised. This is not an assault. Do not fire. We are introducing non-lethal tear gas. Submit to proper authorities. The tanks roll up to the building on April 19th, just after 6 a.m. We will continue to, to gas them and make their environment as uncomfortable as possible until they do exit the compound. The strategy is to move in gradually, inserting small amounts of gas over the course of two days. But in the first seven minutes, the FBI abandons the gradual approach, increasing the gas. They say the Davidians are firing on them. Even though we have probably had over 200 rounds of ammunition fired at us, we have not fired back. At about 10 a.m., Davidian Graham Craddock, an engineer, comes out of the compound, holding a disconnected telephone line. Craddock has told us Koresh sent him out to try to reconnect the phone line, which he claims was cut by advancing tanks. He says Koresh wanted to resume talks with the FBI. I remember sitting in my room and watching the tanks go through the building. Tanks have pushed in walls, crushing staircases and burying the trap door to that underground hideout, the buried bus. Over the speakers, Byron Sage continues to ask the Davidians to come out. He kept saying, and I repeat, this is not a, a, an assault or an attack, but how could it be otherwise? Just before noon, a tank breaches the front of the building. After the tank backs out, the fires start. The civilians claim the tanks had knocked over gas lanterns, but the FBI says these infrared photos prove that three fires began simultaneously in three separate spots, and that FBI internal bugging devices catch Koresh shouting, light the fires, and then don't light it up. I felt heat on the floor, in the air. Ruth Riddle is in her bedroom on the second floor. I could hear crackling sounds, kind of like roaring wind sounds. Although the FBI has said it had a fire safety plan in place, there is no fire equipment standing by. Five minutes after the fire erupts, the command post makes a 911 call to the local fire department. I'd say it's a, it's a pretty good fire. The entire compound is going up right now. There was smoke downstairs all around. I just kind of, I don't know, I just kind of went down on my knees. David Thibodeau says he crawled from the downstairs chapel into an upstairs hallway. And I remember taking my jacket off and my, my gas mask, because at that point I couldn't breathe anyway. The compound that we had sat here and looked at for 51 days. They're still burning in the corner. Uh, we don't see anyone on the We ground. were waiting to see children. We were hoping that children would come out. And the entire complex is on fire. And we watched those children burn. The smoke that's going up is, uh, it's wood. The fire trucks arrived 15 minutes after the fire began, but they're held at a checkpoint four miles away. It will be another 21 minutes before they arrive at the scene. The fire got so hot, um, it was coming down the hallways, outside the windows. The wall next to me caught, caught on fire. It's a horrible, horrible sight here. It got so close and got so hot. And then I looked up and saw out the window. And I was like, for your life, get out. And so I jumped out the window. A very desperate situation. Everything was in slow motion. Looking back, seeing the place on fire, I saw someone fall out of a window. 
and fire. In all, just six men and three women escaped the flames. When I was looking back, they asked me, where, where is everybody? Where are the children? And, you know, what could I say? There, there the building was burning where everybody was. I think that probably six or eight people knew what was going to happen. I think that the rest of them thought, truthfully thought, that it was the apocalypse was, on, was upon them. But I think Medical examiner the... Rodney Crow has helped piece together what happened to the 75 Davidians who remained inside. Crow says that in the cement bunker, 31 mothers and all the children huddle shoulder to shoulder in the fierce heat covered with wet blankets. I think the women that were gathered in that concrete bunker with the blankets over their head, I think, I think they had true intentions of getting out of there. But as fire races through the first and second floors, part of the cement bunker collapses. As the others watch, one child and five women, including Rachel Koresh, are buried alive. Then I think at the last moment, just in desperation, that's when the killing happened. At 1225, agents began hearing bursts of gunfire from inside the compound. There were, per se, executions in there, maybe family members shooting another family member. These were all more like a euthanasia or a merciful killing. An explosion from stored propane gas sends a plume of smoke 200 feet in the air. People in their last moments would gather as a family unit. Uh, one, one family with seven members were gathered where they were all touching each other as they uh, finally fell into a clump. On the second floor beneath the tower, nine men and women gather in the center of a room. They have pistols and bayonets and a 50 caliber gun. My personal interpretation was this was the core of the resistors at the last. If there was indeed all of this firing upon the tanks, it came directly from the observation tower from this group of people. The nine die with their heads together, some from self-inflicted gunshots, bodies pointing outward like the spokes of a wheel. Among them, Neil Viega, father of seven-year-old Joanne. In all, 17 people die of gunshot wounds, 36 as the smoke fills their lungs. Five men and women burned to death. At first it was, oh, 16 people or so escaped the fire, and then it was a woman or two might have been included. Then it's like, please make that that woman or two is my mom. Please make that it's her. Please make that it's her. And then finally they start identifying the people. In the aftermath, a body believed to be Margarita's was found with six others near the blocked passageway to the buried bus. Investigators agree, had they reached the bus, the air supply would probably have kept them alive. Wayne Martin was found alone in the chapel, dead of smoke inhalation. Two days after the fire, there are rumors in Waco that David Koresh has somehow escaped alive. Then his body is found with two of his men in a room off the chapel near the telephones. There was a star-like explosion of the tissue. It traveled from the forehead down to the uh, back left side of the skull and exploded the back side of the head. All of the ingredients were there before a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Where's my friends? Where's my mom and dad? Joanne Viega is now living with her sister, Ursula, in Hawaii. 25 other children died in the fire. The anonymous people that were in there were real people. They had family who loved them, and they loved their family. It's my mother, and she wasn't crazy. She's a beautiful woman, and she didn't deserve to die, and Joanne does not deserve to be without her mother and father. No child at the age of seven should lose their parents. The deaths of these fine agents is a tragedy. There may be some comfort in the novel. And in Washington, shortly after the fire, a memorial service for the four ATF agents who died in the initial raid on the compound. These were the good guys, just wanting to go after the bad guys. The Davidians held a memorial, too. You can't comprehend somebody burning your kids up, your family up. It, it just a long time for you, you know, it really sinks in. This really happened. 
God is going to bring all people into an account for what they have done and will bring back those we've lost. Ruth Riddle is one of 11 Davidians charged in the death of the agents. They have pled not guilty and are standing trial now in Texas. Catherine Madison, David Thibodeau, and Sheila Martin will likely be called as material witnesses in the case. They say the world will end sometime in the next three years. And they're waiting for the return of David Koresh. And when we come back, a late-breaking development in the Nancy Kerrigan story. Now, the latest news of the attack on Olympic hopeful skater Nancy Kerrigan. Late tonight at the Justice Center Jail in Portland, Oregon, police and FBI agents brought in 26-year-old Sean Eckert, the bodyguard of Kerrigan's teammate and rival Tanya Harding. Both Eckert and Derek Smith, who was arrested earlier today, are being charged with criminal conspiracy to commit assault. They're now in custody and being booked tonight. Eckert's bail has been set at $20,000. Stay tuned to ABC News for all the developments in this story, as well as the Menendez brothers' case. As you may have heard, there has been a mistrial declared in the case of the younger brother, Eric. Also, later tonight on Nightline, Ted Koppel gives you unique access to the power brokers as he takes you behind the scenes at the Moscow summit. Also, tomorrow in 2020, a dramatic fight to save the life of an unborn child. Extraordinary footage of surgery inside the womb. I'm Diane Sawyer in New York. Sam will be back next Thursday, and we welcome Phyllis McGrady, our new executive producer. Join us for another edition of Primetime Live next week. Primetime is a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. The American Broadcasting Company, ABC.